call now on Government Order of the Day number 8. Parliamentary Privilege Bill, second reading. Mr Speaker. Honourable Chris Finlayson. Mr Speaker, I move that the Parliamentary Privilege Bill be now read a second time, and I want to begin by endorsing what the Deputy Leader of the Opposition said about the excellent work done by the officials, because they really did do a tremendous job uh, on this bill, and I particularly acknowledge uh, Deborah Angus. I think in her we have, as Mr Parker said, a foremost Commonwealth authority on some of these difficult issues, and I also acknowledge John Pike, uh, QC, who's probably conducted more litigation in this area than any other lawyer in the Commonwealth. I also acknowledge the assistance provided by the submitters, all of whom gave very helpful submissions to the committee. I acknowledge David Cochrane for the Legislative uh, Advisory Committee uh, and the helpful submissions and reports received from overseas parliaments, including the Joint Committee on the House of Lords and the House of Commons on Parliamentary Privilege. Although that committee recently considered that extensive uh, codification is not required in the United Kingdom at the present time, um, it concluded that legislation should only be used where absolutely necessary to resolve uncertainty uh, or in the unlikely event of Parliament's exclusive cognizance being materially diminished by the courts. The bill recognises that in New Zealand uh, we have actually now reached that point. Before turning to the bill, I just want to say something about the importance of the issue because parliamentary privilege is not about giving a license to members of this House to defame outsiders uh, without having to suffer the consequences. Such a cynical view of parliamentary privilege is probably to be expected from some in the community, and I can just about read now some of the portentous editorials and opinion pieces uh, on the subject which can be expected to be produced any day now. But I just want to say they're wrong. And I support what the report of the committee says. Parliamentary privilege is, in fact, one of the building blocks of our democracy. It's the cornerstone of an effective parliament. And protection of parliamentary privilege safeguards democracy itself. It ensures that we, the people's representatives, can debate and deal with the issues of the day freely and frankly, without fear uh, of coercion or punishment and without concern that matters of accountability uh, will be adjudicated on by bodies outside the House. It ensures our democracy roma remains robust and strong. It's also, sir, important to emphasise three key points. First, that parliamentary privilege belongs to Parliament, not its individual members. Secondly, Others who interact with Parliament, such as media and members of the public or officials, may also benefit from the existence and the protection of parliamentary privilege. <clears throat> and thirdly, and this is very important for all of us, with these privileges come obligations. We must be circumspect <coughs> in the use and application of these privileges, and we've got to be mindful of their source and purpose when we invoke them. <coughs> As can be seen from a cursory reading of the bill, we have extensively restructured it to make it easier to interpret, easier to navigate. Instead of two parts, one dealing with substantive provisions and one dealing with savings related amendments and repeals, there were now in fact five parts. Part one deals with preliminary provisions, and what we've done is recast the purpose clause in clause three into a main purpose uh, clause and subsidiary purposes, and that's there for all to see. Clause three, subclause one, sets out the main purposes of the bill, that is to reaffirm and clarify the scope and extent of parliamentary privilege as it applies to the House, its members and committees, and to ensure adequate protection from civil and criminal liability for communication of and documents relating to proceedings in Parliament. Yes, indeed, they are high-level statements of the principles, uh, but they were not so clearly uh, and cogently expressed in the original clause. And then subclause two uh, sets out the subsidiary purposes to help it achieve the main purposes 
uh, and I'll uh, speak about them a little later on. Then what we've done is insert a new clause 3A, and that stipulates that the bill has to be interpreted in a way that promotes its main and subsidiary principles, and importantly, that it must be interpreted in a way which promotes the principle of comity. Comity requires that the separate and independent branches of government, the legislature and the judiciary, show mutual respect, respect and restraint in the other's sphere of influence. And this is not a legislative innovation, because this, this principle of comity has long been uh, recognised. The new clause 3A emphasises the importance of understanding this constitutional context when dealing with questions relating to parliamentary privilege or proceedings in Parliament. And then we come to a new part 1A, and it's the very heart of the bill. Clause 6 sets out the purpose of parliamentary privilege, that is, the privileges, immunities and powers of the House are exercisable to uphold the integrity of the House as a democratic legislative assembly and to secure the independence of the House, the members and the committees in the performance of their functions. Clause 8 uh, of the Bill as introduced broadly followed Section 16 of the Australian Parliamentary Privileges Act 1987, but what we've done is work to make this provision clear, simple and easy to understand, uh, and that of course is very important when one is considering a major constitutional piece of legislation like this. We've recommended changes for a new subpart two of the new part 1A of the bill to separate the key components of clause eight into eight separate clauses and we've also recommended changes to simplify and modernise the language. So what will happen is that these clauses still broadly follow Section 16 of the Australian Act. Uh, they do not replace but declare the effect of Article 9 of the Bill of Rights Act uh, 1688, which states that the freedom of speech and debates or proceedings in Parliament ought not to be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of Parliament. We had an interesting discussion about some of the terminology and whether or not it could be updated. Uh, but after uh, some deliberation, the committee suggests the bill continue to reflect the original uh, language of Article 9, and this is reaffirmed by clauses 8A to 8H, but these provisions do not directly override or amend Article 9, rather they sit alongside it. So while new clauses 8C to 8F make clear of what is intended by impeaching or questioning uh, in relation to of a proceeding in Parliament, the Bill does not limit the full extent and the richness of the meaning of the Bill of Rights Act uh, 1688, one of our most important constitutional documents. Clause 8B is an extremely important clause because, for the first time, I think, we actually tried to define proceedings in Parliament for the purposes of Article 9 and the Bill. It's important to note the committee recommended changes to ensure that proceedings include matters that relate to the transacting of reasonably apprehended business. It's also made explicit that necessity is not, I emphasise that, is not the appropriate test to apply when determining what may be a proceeding in Parliament. The changes recommended by the committee make it clear beyond any doubt whatsoever that the reduction in the scope of parliamentary privilege resulting from the decision in Attorney General and Gao and Lee is reversed. And I quote again from the committee's report, our proposed definition recognises that much of the vital business of Parliament is transacted away from the floor of the House or in reasonable anticipation of parliamentary business, and it's critical that the privilege apply to such proceedings. A necessity test is, with the greatest of respect, utterly misconceived. We consider the device provided to ministers of preparation for reasonably expected questions in the House has occurred in the Lee case uh, and proceedings are proceedings in Parliament under this definition. Let me also say something about another case that went off to the Privy Council arising out of something here, Buchanan and Jennings. 
Uh, that was a defamation action against an MP who, after making a statement in the House, was said to have effectively repeated it when he said outside the House that he did not resile from the statements made in the House. The case established that where such a statement was made, that was an effective repetition, and the proceedings of Parliament could itself be used in evidence. In its 2013 report, the Privileges Committee recommended abolition of the doctrine of effective repetition, and this was included in the bill as introduced. What we've done here, sir, is recommend changes to new Clause 8C, including the addition of new paragraph, subparagraphs D and E, to prevent proceedings in Parliament being relied on to prove or disprove facts necessary to establish liability in court or otherwise being used to resolve, support or resist court proceedings. The bill as introduced also included a statement in what was Clause 10 that effective repetition statements were protected by absolute privilege as well as establishing an evidential barrier. The committee recommends removing all provisions relating to absolute privilege and relying on a strengthened evidential barrier against the courts using proceedings in Parliament. Part 1b further simplifies the framework for protecting the broadcasting and publishing of proceedings in Parliament. The new Clause 15 replaces Clauses 11 to 13 and 15 to 16 of the Bill as introduced. It provides for a stay of court or tribunal proceedings that have been brought on the basis of a proceeding in Parliament or of a document related to a proceeding in Parliament communicated under the authority of the House, such as broadcasts made under the authority of the House. Subpart 2 of 1b deals with the qualified immunity available as a defence to proceedings based on fair and accurate reports uh, of proceedings in Parliament. Of course, being a qualified immunity, it will not be available where a defendant was motivated by bad faith or ill will. Time prevents me uh, from dealing with the remaining parts, um, but um, I will leave that to uh, other members of Parliament to address, but simply say this in conclusion, parliamentary privilege stands as an independent and vital part of our constitutional arrangements. What this bill does is address incremental infractions on that constitutional principle over the years and affirms the principles that help ensure a strong democracy. I commend the bill to the House. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I recognise the Honourable David Parker. Thank, thank you.